Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I am your host, Richard Byrne, and you're here for seven ways to help kids discover and analyze new information. Thanks so much for joining me. We have more than 200 people registered to attend and or watch the video recording later. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things as we get started. Those of you who have been following me online on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, someplace like that, are familiar with the ongoing saga of my office space. And uh, that's why I'm out here in the barn today. Uh, so that's item number one. Item number two, uh, today's webinar is sponsored by Kids Discover, Kids Discover Online. Uh, you can check them out at kidsdiscover.com. And we will take a look at a couple of the resources that they have uh, for helping kids discover new information and analyze and read new information. So we'll be looking at that today. And today's, we are joined in the webinar by Ted Levine, who is the president of Kids Discover Online. And I'm going to let him introduce himself here in just one moment. So hi, Ted. Hey, Richard. How's it going? Great. Thanks for being here. Yeah, happy to uh, join in, and uh, thanks so much for working with us this fall. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, really excited for today's program. I did just want to give a quick overview of Kids Discover Online. We offer up a subscription-based library of nonfiction resources, it's really targeted at elementary and middle school learners, uh, but uh, we have learners of all ages using it, and uh, some really cool tools, different modes to enter into the library, some sort of non-linear, non-traditional ways of getting into content, uh, which I think Richard's going to uh, touch upon and ways to incorporate Kids Discover into some of those activities. So super excited to be on with you today and uh, excited to learn a few things. I made the mistake of talking without the mic on. Uh, so thanks, Ted, for, for being here and being with us. Uh, Ted is going to jump in at a couple different points in the webinar today. Uh, but just one last housekeeping item for folks who have not been in a webinar with me in the past. Uh, there is a option in GoToWebinar for you to ask questions. And I want to encourage you to ask as many questions as you can think of throughout the webinar. I will go off and, and answer any of your questions as they, as they roll in. If it seems like a question that might be uh, better suited towards the end, I might say, okay, I recognize your question and I'll, and I'll get back to it at the end. Uh, but I, I do want to encourage you to ask questions. That's one of the best parts of being here for a live webinar is that uh, you get to kind of influence uh, the way the, the direction of the webinar goes and you get your, your questions answered in real time. Uh, now, of course, if you're watching the recording of this, you're more than welcome to send me an email, richard at burn.media, and I'd more than happy to answer your questions that way. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn off my webcam. You don't need to stare at my face for the next hour. Uh, what's more important is what's on the screen. So I'm going to turn off my webcam. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I will be making a copy of these slides and the recording available to everyone. Uh, so I want to talk today about helping our students discover and analyze new information. And I want to start with talking about the myth of the digital native. Uh, this is a term that Mark Prinsky uh, coined more than a decade ago now, and we still hear it used, uh, you know, that our students are digital natives. And oftentimes, uh, we misinterpret what digital native really means. It may mean that, yes, uh, our students have grown up with a cell phone in their pockets at all times. They've grown up with uh, ubiquitous access to the internet and they've grown up with Google, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are great digital native citizens. Uh, and I see, uh, I see a question already popping in there. That's great. Oh, Ted says you can't see my screen. Thanks for that, Ted. Let's try that. Now you should be able to see my screen. So let's talk about the, that myth of the digital native. One of the, one of the pieces of this is helping kids recognize that just because you can type something on your computer or speak something into your phone doesn't mean you necessarily know how to search well. And I think this is one of the challenges that anyone who is a teacher librarian or anyone who is very uh, 
vested and interested in search has experienced in their own in their own classroom. By the way, do we have any teacher librarians with us today? Uh, if you're a teacher librarian, uh, I want to give you a, a shout out here right at the beginning and say uh, your teacher librarian is your best friend when it comes to search and helping your students become better searchers, researchers, and uh, and and I think we I think I see a couple of people who said yes. Ah, uh, yes, Jennifer jumped in there and she's a teacher librarian. Thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and get back into the webinar. So let's start with this idea that search is really a thought process. Um, oop, oop, let me go backwards. Okay. Search is a thought process, and that, that's how we can help our students discover and organize new information. Uh, you, know, you think about when you go to sit at your computer uh, or you take out your phone because you have a, a question, maybe you're you know, out with your friends for a nice Saturday afternoon lunch and you know, that trivia comes up and you take out your phone and you start to search. Our students do that all the time, or we've given a topic to our students and they take out their computers and they search. And oftentimes we search without thinking about the process itself. We don't stop and think about what do we already know about this topic that we are starting to research. I think this is one of the things that um, digital natives do is they just grab the phone or they grab the keyboard and they don't stop and think about what they already know. And if they did stop and think about what they already knew, they would find that they don't have to do as many searches. They find that they'll have to do deeper searches, but they don't do as many searches because they've jogged their memories. They don't, they don't have to spend time doing searches for the basics. They don't have to necessarily do the, the three bullet points of a topic, they've already got that down if they stop and think about it or, or they look in their notebooks or look whether that's physical or digital notebook, stop and think about what do they already have. And the next part of it is uh, helping students develop better search terms and phrases. And one of the great activities you can do with elementary school and middle school students and high school students as well is have them sit and brainstorm and think about the words that other people would use for the same topic. And this is a, something you can do collaboratively. Because uh, for, for many of us, uh, we start to think about a topic and we, we think about it in our own way, in our, in our own minds. And it can be very helpful to have somebody else walk up and say, well, did you think about it this way? Or did you consider that someone else might use a completely different word for this? And I'll give you a real life example of this that happened to me just a couple of years ago. And I, I've shared this on other webinars in the past. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to a conference in London and I was going to be arriving uh, early in the day, too early for me to check into my hotel room. And I wanted to find a place to leave my winter jacket while I was in the convention center. It was January, I flew, over, flew from Boston to London, landed in the morning, needed a place to hang my winter jacket while I was at the conference. I was searching high and low in that conference center on their, on their website to find a coat check room, a bag check room, a, a place where I could leave my, leave my jacket for the day. I never did find it. And I, so I just kind of said, well, you know what? I'll get to the conference center and maybe I'll just dumb luck my way into it. And sure enough, I did dumb luck my way into it after wandering around for a while. What I found was a cloak room, C-L-O-A-K, cloak room, a term that I had never thought of to use in my search for finding this, what I would call as an American, a coat check room or a bag check room at a convention center. Had I just stopped and thought for two minutes about how other people would describe this, I would have saved myself probably 15 minutes of searching and 20 minutes of walking around a convention center kind of aimlessly. 
So always have students think about and brainstorm the words and terms another person might use. Now, I made a checklist years ago that I will have students work through before they start a search, before they start their search process uh, to, to, make, to make them stop and think. And I'll share this link uh, here in the chat right now. And I'll also share this as a, as a link and a follow-up email for, for everyone who's here uh, or everyone that's registered on the webinar. Let me put that in the chat room for the entire audience right now. So if you're here in the live session, you want to take a look at that right now, you can. You click on that link, that Google document. And down at the bottom of this, I have my pre-search checklist. And there's not a whole lot to it in terms of complexity. And that's intentional. Uh, I'm just looking for getting students to think about the process before they start going down the rabbit hole of Google or the rabbit hole of Wikipedia or you know, pick your pick your favorite search engine. The rabbit hole of YouTube. By the way, YouTube is the third most searched website in the United States in terms of where do we go to search. We go to search on Google, Wikipedia, and YouTube. Uh, in that in that order, right? but just have students think about the, these specific things they know about the topic. What do you already know, and then you know the other words and phrases that you might, might use. And feel free to make a copy of this and use it in your own classroom if you'd like, or pass it out to to your colleagues if you'd like. Now, I, this, I'm not going to turn this into a, a to a Google search summit or Google search workshop today, but I do want to point out a couple of quick little things that you should have your students be aware of uh, and or your colleagues if they're not aware of it. Number one is the ability to search by domain. Uh, this can help students discover a lot of new information. Um, when they refine their web searches, according to domain, rather than just relying on the search engine to give them the first thing, uh, the most popular thing, most popular resource. Uh, so for example, now my background is in social studies. Now the 20th Maine Regiment, famous regiment during the Civil War, my student is doing a little research on the 20th Maine. Now, if they just type in 20th Maine into Google, we'll see they have 119,000 results. And most of the students, as we know, won't go beyond the first three pages of search results. So this is where searching by domain can be very helpful. So we'll go into our settings and the advanced search option, and let's have our students do a search by site or domain for let's say dot k12 dot me dot us so that's the top level domain for all k12 schools in the state of maine every state in the united states has their own k12 domains they can do dot k12 dot tx dot us if you're in texas and now we're down to just one result now if i did 20th maine and left out the word regiment I might get a little bit more there we go. There we have 38 results. 20th Maine uh, resources from K-12 schools in the state of Maine. This is information that may be very useful to my students, but would not have popped up had they not refined that by top-level domain. Now, your students can do a search by uh, country domain every Every country has its own top-level domain. Uh, in Canada, it's .ca. And I have a list there of uh, top-level domains that you can access. Um, one of the other things that I recommend doing is having kids look to see uh, what other work has been created on the same topic. In our K-12 schools, uh, for the most part, uh, if you're a K-12, if you're a high school student with me, with Richard Byrne, and uh, in Western Maine, uh, the, the topics that you're going to be learning about and reading about and researching are pretty similar to the topics that students in U.S. history classes in 
North Dakota or Michigan or Wyoming are, are going to be doing. So there's a good chance that other students have already published things on this topic. Uh, there's a good chance that other teachers have published resources on this topic. So I'll have students look for uh, content published by others uh, by just doing a search for that top level domain of .docs.google.com and that'll give kids access to uh, Google Docs slides and, and spreadsheets published by others. Uh, on a similar note, you might have students search for specific file types. Uh, and this is an important thing for, for us as teachers to recognize uh, that uh, you know, what we're giving our, our students as assignments is often uh, not really invent, reinventing the wheel, all that you know, we, we may be uh, changing the color of the wheel or the, uh, the, you know, might be switching from white walls to, uh, to solid black walls on our, on our wheels, but we're not really always reinventing the wheel with, with some of our, our, our topics. You know, the, teaching the American Civil War, <laughs> we've, been, we've been teaching that for quite a long time. Uh, you know, so we're going to have students search by file type to see what else is out there. What have other people published about this topic? Uh, so we'll do a, a search by file type and let's take a look at, you know, you know stick with my, my 20th main and down there in my advanced search, my student might go and search for a file type of, uh, let's look for a PowerPoint. And now my students, uh, you know, they've, they've found a PowerPoint. They'll be able to find and look at that PowerPoint that has a reference to the 20th main inside it somewhere here. Now I'm not saying to, to copy and paste this and reuse it as their own work, but I do think it's important to note that, uh, that our kids can do that and they might build upon that and modify something that they, that they find that way. All right, so once our students start searching and, and they get into the search process and you know, they, they've tried searching by domain or they tried searching by file type, um, I think it's important uh, for our students to, to recognize uh, that search is not a one-time activity. Uh, researching a topic is an ongoing process. Now, maybe they have a time frame of two weeks to turn in their final project or their final paper or give their presentation. Or maybe it's a one week timeline they have, or maybe it's just two or three days. But it's an ongoing process and waiting. And, and as we all know, as teachers, we try to prevent them from waiting until the last minute to do it. Um, but no, no matter whether they, they wait until the very last minute, you know, the last you know, the Sunday night at nine o'clock, they start on the they start on the research, or they started it the day you gave it to them. Uh, there is a, a a path that they go down, and it's important for students to keep track of that path that they go down, uh, because in keeping track of the path of their research, they'll find more ideas for search. They'll find more words and phrases that other people use. And they'll be able to build upon what they've already done in the past. So I encourage kids to use charts and webs and tracking as they do their searches. And your elementary school kids can do this, middle school kids can do this, and high school students can do this. And really, our college students should be doing it as well. Uh, now, to that end, one of the things that Kids Discover offers uh, is a great tool to help kids find connections between topics uh, through a webbed approach. Um, and we'll take a look at that here. Um, so I'm here on, on Kids Discover online kidsdiscover.com and I'm signed into signed into my account. Uh, you can use your Google account or your clever account to sign in or you can use your traditional email and, and password uh, registration. But let's take a look at this discover mode. Now a student, and I have a student account as well. And my, my student here will just see the discover and classroom. Right? Student who clicks on discover. Let's say he or she is uh, not quite certain of where their search is going to go yet. Uh, they start with 
historical figures. And they want to do, and they're going to do some some research about uh, Abraham Lincoln while I'm on my Civil War topic here. Now, any of these in blue that you see on my screen, that'll take us to an article directly about Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's path to the White House. We can click on that and read read through the article. One of the things you'll see up here is medium, easier, hard reading level. Uh, on the teacher side, you'll actually see a, a Lexile index. A student can read this article. Uh, you see here, and expand the images as, as needed. And some articles also include also include video. So the student gets down to the bottom here, okay? and you'll see next topic in Lincoln, okay, in Lincoln's memory, and we can go to that topic. Or let's go back and get back to our Lincoln web, and we can see, well, what else is Lincoln connected to? What other topics is, are connected to, to Lincoln? Um, presidency, money, oh, that's an interesting connection, Lincoln and money, so maybe we, we click on money. And now we see all these topics related to money, but there's Lincoln there as well, and we can click back and look at it that way. And since Ted is uh, intimately involved in development of this, I'm going to invite him to, to jump in here and, and say a few words. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, you know, I think the thought process behind when we engineered Discover Mode was this notion that, you know, most of us today think of search as a search box. And of course, you can search Kids Discover online through a traditional search box. But this idea of having a visual search, um, having something that for an elementary or middle school student where they can visualize connections across a certain subject that they're looking into and maybe reveal topics or units that might not be an obvious connection. Uh, there was a way to do that through this webbed approach. And so that's kind of the basis behind Discover Mode is you can dive into a topic that you know you want to do some research about, you know you're going to be studying, uh, and then you can see sort of other units uh, that are related to it, some that might be obvious. Uh, you know, for some students, uh, Lincoln and Civil War uh, are inherently connected. Uh, but the example that Richard clicked on money, uh, you know, that might draw a student's curiosity and say, well, how is that connected to Lincoln? And they might find an article um, sort of, you know, money through the ages and, you know, understand a little bit of a deeper context and maybe stumble upon something that they weren't necessarily looking for that they weren't, wouldn't find in a traditional search engine. And uh, I think because Kids Discover Online is you know, a collection of uh, about 150 different science and social studies units, it's more approachable than searching the entire internet, um, especially for students. And so, you know, it's a really cool tool for students to go into. It's definitely our most uh, popular tool uh, among students that they like to use. It's a lot of fun to play around with. And uh, I think the other notion that, that Richard touched upon is sort of this cross-curricular uh, notion that, you know, you could click into Lincoln and you, then you could click into money like we are right here and you can see that's also connected to ancient China. So, you know, you would never necessarily think to search for something around ancient China, uh, you know, in the same search as Lincoln, but in discover mode with just a few clicks, you can land there. And that's a really cool sort of nonlinear path that you only get through a sort of visual search like this. Great. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, and while we're on this this money topic, again, we went from Lincoln to money uh, over to ancient China, but we could also go to how America works. And you know, I think anyone who's ever uh, lost a half an hour of their day to the to the the rabbit hole of Wikipedia or the rabbit hole of YouTube can relate to uh, how this could be a, a good use of your students' time when they're starting a research uh, research project or they're or you're just trying to spark some more curiosity uh, in your students um, and, and I, I I really do love this 
this pathway, if you will, uh, between each one of these um, each one of these topics. And you know, we we end up here with uh, America's democracy, and you know, and and there's our there's our article, and of course, our student can then go back and 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 work their way backwards through these connections as well, which gets me into this next point. And again, this is, you know, anyone who, who's here in the webinar, either live or, or watching the recording, feel free to, to use this. This is not anything that I've, uh, I've copyrighted or even really invented myself. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just a chart that I put to, that I put together probably back in 2004, 2005, I started using charts like this with my students, particularly when we were in a, a computer lab environment. Um, you know, fortunately, the, the, last, the last handful of years that I was in, in the classroom full time, every one of my students had, a, had either a MacBook or um, a netbook to use at, at all times. But uh, earlier in my career, we had to go down to the go down to the library, go down to the computer lab to use the computer. And I wanted to make sure that my students leveraged that time and use that time efficiently. And so I, I came up with these uh, this method of using charts before we start search and then during the search process, keeping track of you know, what term or terms did I use to do my search? What did I find? Uh, when I started doing this, I was teaching ninth grade students and I found that ninth grade students, much like middle school and elementary school students, weren't always the best at bookmarking their websites or, or organizing the websites that they found in their research. So I had them actually write down, uh, okay, what website did I use, the, the full URL, what did I find, and what did I find on that page, and you know, whether or not I should go back and spend more time on this in my next visit to the computer lab or my next visit to the library. Uh, you know, just a Real quick chart. You can obviously you can modify this chart, make it make it larger or smaller for your for your own needs. Um, but I found that to be super useful in maximizing my students' uh, time spent on search. And speaking of of computer labs and um, and going to the library, uh, you'll find, and I, I'm sure you anyone who has uh, worked in a computer lab environment or, or a library environment has seen this happen. Search is a very social activity for a lot of our students. Uh, in fact, it, back in 2009, Microsoft started to do some research on this. Uh, and they found in their study that as much as half of all online research in 2009, and so this is back, in, this is, we're talking uh, almost, uh, eight, we're talking eight years ago now. Uh, Almost half of all the research that was done online included some kind of collaborative component. And I'm sure that there's even more collaboration today when you think about uh, your own Facebook feed and you know, the way that we look for information today. Now look at your own Facebook feed and, and see how many of your friends have asked for a recommendation recently. Uh, that's, that's search. That is a component of search. Now collaborative search could also be uh, you know, our kids are sharing a computer, a computer today, or they're they're sharing an iPad, or they're sharing a, a an Android tablet or a Chromebook in the classroom, and we want them to think about okay, what are the terms that we can develop together, and also think about search in a collaborative manner as who can I ask, uh, who in my world and in, in my sphere of contacts could I ask. To help me out with this search, uh, you know, it could be mom and dad, it could be uh, uncle, it could be you know, the neighbor next door, or it might even be another teacher in your in your school. Uh, but have kids write down, you know, who can I ask, or who did I ask? Uh, what did they share, and and should I investigate this in a little bit more depth? Again, just a very simple chart, but it helps. Um, but it helps kids organize and keep track of where they're going. Uh, Kim asked a question regarding uh, pricing for kids discover. And I believe that Ted will answer that question at the end. Uh, what you're seeing on my screen so far, Kim, is all uh, stuff you could do just logging in and signing up today with a, with a free account, with a Google account. Now, 
Now, I do want to point out that you can make your own search engine, particularly for your younger students. It can be very helpful for our, our K3, K4 students uh, to make our own little search engines to you know, kind of shrink down the web a little bit. Uh, as Ted mentioned, uh, Kids Discover has about 150, 150 uh, units with many, many resources within each of those units. And so that's a smaller microcosm of the web. Uh, but if you want to go even smaller than that, you could make your own at, at google.com slash CSE for custom search engine. It's a rather straightforward process. Uh, google.com forward slash CSE. And your student, you can log in and make a search engine that only indexes a handful of websites. And it can be a good exercise in helping students uh, sort through a small section of the web. Or if you want to create a, a small lesson plan and helping students analyze information, maybe you put in a couple of websites. Um, and we'll, we'll start here with our, our, our search engine. I'm going to put in one right now, dhmo.org, which is one I use for uh, teaching about uh, recognizing fake websites. Uh, but I'll, I'll also put in two other sites. And we'll just call this one our sample October 17. And we'll create that search engine. And now this search engine, go to the public address for it, will only return results from those three websites. Uh, I'll put that link there in the chat for anyone who wants to try it out. Uh, maybe I want to find some quick information regarding DHMO. And we find that all of our resources are coming from that DHMO.org website. By the way, it's a spoof website designed for teaching how to recognize fake websites. Um, we could do another search in here and say, War of 1812 and do my search. And there's all my resources. Uh, from just the just those three websites is all that gets indexed by this search engine. Again, shrinks down the web, makes it manageable for our students. You can make as many search engines as you want. So let's say you're you're the teach if you're the teacher librarian and you want to make you know a website uh, a search engine for K2 students and one for uh, you know your three five students, you can you can do that. You can make as many as you like. Uh, and I just saw another question pop popped in there. So let me go ahead and take a look at. Take a look at that as well. Uh, so Peggy asks, can you add sites to your custom search engine that require a login? Uh, you can, but your students wouldn't be able to access the content. That makes any sense, and it won't index it. Uh, so that, so yes, you could add it, uh, but it won't it won't index uh, much like. Um, uh, but it's similar, similar in style, uh, Peggy, to Google Scholar. And, you know, sometimes the results in Google Scholar uh, will just take you to a page where you have to log in and pay a subscription fee to get into the to get into the website. Um, that sort of that sort of thing. So let's look at point number three. The, the third thing we can do to help kids. Discover and analyze new information. And I think one of the things that uh, anyone who studied any kind of web marketing of late has noticed is that uh, we spend more time watching video today than we do reading articles on the web. Um, now, this refers to our, our casual web use, not our not our research, but it, but it definitely carries over. Um, and in doing so, it, it's important to note that. Of all the videos that the, the online videos that you 
will come across on YouTube or Vimeo or pick your favorite site, uh, more than half don't get watched for more than two minutes. Uh, that research came from Wistia, who, who did a study last year, last summer they, they, they did that study. So all those videos, half of them don't get watched for more than about two minutes. But two minutes can pack in a lot of good content, but it speaks to our attention spans uh, and the attention span of, of our students. And that uh, They're going to move on from, from video quite quickly. So you, you think about uh, you know, your, your favorite source of educational videos, whether that's uh, Crash Course with, with Hank and John Green or uh, Khan Academy or anything like that, that has a lot of videos that are 10 to 12 minutes long. A lot of those may not get watched all the way through. So we think about I, having students identify smaller nuggets of information in, in these in short videos. Um, and that's not to say that longer videos aren't, aren't useful. But when we're looking at, at the content, I think short videos are often the way to go. And consuming that information in, in multiple formats uh, definitely helps with the retention of new vocabulary. Uh, you know, something that, we, something that we all probably you know, know as teachers, uh, that if we can give our kids multiple opportunities to uh, consume, to, to consume the new information and, and process the new information, uh, that they'll have a better chance of re retaining it. Uh, but I bring that point up because when students consume that information in multiple formats, whether that's uh, the short video, whether it's reading, uh, maybe it's some interactive uh, chart or diagram, uh, maybe it's the web and kids discover, what that leads students to do often is to ask more questions. So that's why I think it's important to have our students search for resources that are not just text, not just PowerPoint, not just video, but look for information in all three formats or four formats or five formats if possible. Uh, you know, increasingly, we're now finding places where we can find virtual reality or augmented reality uh, bits of information and that increases the, the opportunity for our students to ask more questions. When they ask more questions, they then do more search and they find more information and the cycle goes on. But in doing so, again, I want to remind you that I think it's important to keep track of all those steps. How did our students get to the place that they are in their search process? And once we start finding this information, you know, we're, we're taking our notes or writing it down, it's time to analyze it and decide what is going to end up in our research paper, in our presentation, in our video that we're making, in our uh, Google Earth tour that we're making. Whatever the final output is, uh, I think it's important that we have a plan for how how we're going to analyze what's good, what's not, what we're going to keep in, what we're going to what we're going to throw out. Um, and that gets back again to this same idea of you know, what do we know is true? What do we discover? And do these things match? This is a very simple thing that you can have your students do as they are looking at the information that, that they find, whether that's, that, again, that video, that text, um, any other format that you choose, augmented reality formats, um, virtual reality formats. Comparing what do we know is true versus what do we discover? And do these things match up? Because if they don't match up, maybe we don't include them. Um, and one of, the, one of the features of Kids Discover that I, that I like, and I'm going to ask Ted to speak about in just a moment here, uh, is that there are components in the articles and in the, and in the classroom side of things for, for teachers to help students analyze that, that information that they might find uh, through, through their, their Kids Discover web or through the materials that you you share with them. Uh, so T Ted, would you mind speaking about that for just a moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there is sort of, you know, I'll, I'll first start by saying that um, 
Kids Discover works very closely with a lot of leading professors uh, at universities and various organizations across the country to fact check and vet all the information that we publish. So just sort of a blanket statement there that uh, the, the text and articles that's within Kids Discover Online is fact checked and of course sometimes doing a regular Google search can be a little bit of a goose chase uh, to figure out what uh, is accurate and not, especially for kids at you know a reading level for you know let's say uh, K eight learners. Um, but I think obviously the process of trying to decide whether or not uh, you know an article or uh, you know a piece of research is factual is a great exercise for students. And so what we do is we have various questions embedded. Uh, throughout the reading experience and then also a customizable assessments tool um, that you can build questions that go along with the content you're currently working on with your students. So unlike Discover Mode, which we sort of looked at, we also have this classroom feature. If you're familiar with Google Classroom, there is some nice overlap there. Um, Richard did mention that we have single sign-on with Google, but in terms of functionality, you can save various articles and topics to your classroom you can see Richard has nine different ones saved to his classroom here, and you can organize those and sort them in whatever uh, way that you like. So when your students sign in, they sort of see today's reading. Um, so that's uh, a great feature that we offer. And then you can also build a custom quiz, a, a, a test, all the way down to a one question, uh, essay question, homework assignment, uh, using a question of over 5,000 already made questions that align with all of our content. So there are a lot of assessment tools that are out on the market within Kids Discover Online, a paid subscription, you get access to your own uh, customizable assessments builder. Uh, and again, each article within our platform has anywhere between two and six different questions that are aligned with it. Uh, that's a mix of multiple choice, short answer, uh, true, false, and discussion questions, which are really sort of like essay questions. Um, so interestingly enough, you know, those true, false, and multiple choice questions, um, you know, they, you know, generally do have an answer, uh, you know, and we will go ahead and grade those automatically on your behalf. Um, but for a short answer question or discussion question, those are open-ended. You know, students are going to answer those, and of course, those are a little bit more subjective, and whether they're taking that assessment within Kids Discover Online, and just using Kids Discover Online material, or they're taking that assessment within Kids Discover Online and using a mix of Kids Discover content and outside content, this is a great way to uh, assess your students and get a better gauge of how they understand the material. Um, you can also create your own custom questions. So if you wanted to compare and contrast an article within Kids Discover Online versus an article that you found on the web, you could go ahead and create whatever kind of question you wanted and, and administer that directly through Kids Discover Online. So uh, I think there's a lot of ways to sort of incorporate that. Uh, there's some sort of finite answers and then there's some more open-ended questions that you can set up. Um, but those are some of the other ways that we kind of help support, uh, you know, knowing what's true versus what's been presented and really assessing your students, understanding the, the sort of evidence that they've been able to uh, view and then sort of uh, report back to you. Great, thanks, Ted. And you know, while you were while Ted was speaking, I was showing on my screen uh, how you can create a short assessment based on an article that that you have selected for your students. Uh, I would also suggest that you could have your students uh, suggest to you articles that, that they find interesting and use those. And, and so I just made that assessment and I, and I published it online. I, I could also publish it as a PDF, you can see, as you can see right there. Uh, and, I, and I have here in my, uh, my demonstration student account, there's a new assessment from, from Mr. Byrne. Let's go ahead and, and take that one. Uh, now, this assessment is based on let's say all of the readings that I've given on this particular topic. If I go back one screen, you can see all the readings that have been assigned by the teacher, in this case me, 
to the students. Uh, and so they can see, okay, I need to read uh, how the pyramids got their start if I'm going to take that assessment. Okay. Now, uh, along those same lines, and you know what I just did there with, with creating that, that sample assessment is something that, that we're always going to ask our students to do throughout the, the research process and discovery, and that's analyzing the context and the, the greater context of anything that we find. Uh, you know, and again, whether I whether I do this um, oh, and Peggy, I'm not ignoring your question. I'll, I will I will get to your question at the end. That may be a question that's that's actually better suited for Ted, uh, but I can I can field that one as well. Uh, so let's talk about analyzing context, and I love using this example. This is an example that just fell into my lap last winter. Uh, as I was scrolling through my own Facebook feed, I found this little meme that was shared by a, a Facebook acquaintance of mine uh, or a Facebook connection of mine. I love that Facebook now calls them connections and not friends. Uh, so a Facebook connection of mine shared this meme and it struck me as being you know, maybe not 100% accurate or that it definitely had a bias to it. And, and so I've been using this for the last uh, nine months or so in helping students understand the importance of context as they analyze the information. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the, this little uh, meme pointed out that cannabis had 34 treatments for cancer and is not FDA approved, but chemotherapy was discovered by poisoning people with mustard gas and is FDA, FDA approved, let it sink in. Uh, and so I bring this up because, you know, obviously a student needs to understand the context of, of what is happening here. And to that end, you know, some strategies to help our students look for and, and analyze the context. So your, your classic document-based question, uh, one of the things that, that I've done in the past in, in um, teaching document-based questions, document-based questions and document analysis is just having students simply find a counterpoint to the same article. Uh, you know, using the same facts, but can you find a counterpoint to it? Uh, and, and that can be done, again, through a graphic organizer. Jigsaw reading is wonderful for this, particularly when you're getting into topics that may not have a clear cut right and wrong answer. Uh, you know, when we, when we when we get away from when we get, get away from math and science, uh, and we and we get into the the humanities, we often will find there's fewer right and wrong answers and much more gray. And that's where a jigsaw reading can be be wonderful. Uh, in a, in a situation like this one here that that I had on my screen with the with the meme, a reverse image search, uh, just uh, uploading uploading the image to Google Images or uploading it to Tin I Tin I dot com do a reverse image search to see where did that image really come from uh, and how is that image, how, how has it been, manip been manipulated? Uh, by the way, Lifehacker had a great article today uh, all about uh, how, to, how to determine whether or not an image is fake or real. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll share that in the, uh, in the final slides that, that go out to everybody. And finally, just looking at the, the difference between summarizing the article and synthesizing multiple articles. Uh, that's something that, that all of our students struggle with and you know, even uh, I was talking to a, to a friend of mine who was a, a, a PhD advisor the other day and she mentioned uh, that many of her students struggle with, even at that level, uh, breaking away from summarizing and really starting to synthesize the information. So look at what can we do to synthesize uh, and part of that is again figuring out where this information fits in context. And to that point, uh, s saving, sharing, and revisiting our research findings is a key component in developing that synthesis of the information. Uh, you know, I'll share quickly some places to, to save and share the findings. Of, you know, if you're a Digo user, um, Google Keep or Google Classroom or Kids Discover Online Classroom, all three places are fine for you for you to share 
and your students to share uh, some of their discoveries. And sharing is a key component in this process because it allows us to get to give feedback to students and for students to give feedback to each other on their findings. Again, getting back into that synthesizing piece. And I want to stress revisiting, uh, revisiting the research, revisiting the findings, because uh, th there's a strong bias uh, that that will develop with our students of the, the first in, first out, what I call a first in, first out bias, or the availability heuristic. Of uh, it's these are the first two or three resources I found. They're the first ones that stuck out to me that were helpful and so therefore those are going to be my go-to resources throughout my research paper, throughout my research presentation, throughout my video. Um, and we're, we become biased because they stuck out to us as the first good ones that we found. And they may not necessarily be the best ones if we, uh, after finding six or seven or eight more resources, if we go back and revisit our originals, we may, may find that they, they're not quite as good as we, as we initially thought they were. So that's why I stress to, uh, stress to students, revisit your original findings after finding a handful or, or more additional resources. And we'll conclude today with the idea of providing guiding feedback on our students' discoveries. Uh, it, it can be very tempting um, to jump in and quickly say, no, you're going down the wrong path. Uh, uh, and I think Vicki Davis and Monica Burns and I talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago in, in another webinar about, about inquiry-based learning. Uh, it's, there's a, a strong temptation for, for many of us to uh, identify quickly that a student's going down the wrong path in a research uh, research endeavor and jump in and say no don't don't do that you're, you're gonna you're gonna waste time you're gonna lose time and I think it's important to, to note that, that even though they may be going down the wrong path in the research uh, that it's not a waste of time uh, that part of the process is ending up at that at that dead end or ending up uh, having to take three extra steps in the research process to get to um, the information that they that they really need. Um, so avoid that, that jumping in and saying, no, that's not going to work. Yes, that is going to work. And let them feel it out and provide guiding feedback, not necessarily yes, no feedback. Um, and that's where, again, uh, some of the resources that Kids Discover offers in helping, student, in helping provide feedback. Uh, Ted already spoke about this. Uh, in the, in the assessment piece, that there's a mix of question formats that you can give to students, both uh, multiple choice and true false, but also that discussion piece uh, that's available. And we always want to remember to combine these strategies. That none, of, none of these things independently fix our students' uh, research habits or improve our students' research habits independently. Uh, it's the, the combination of multiple strategies that really makes uh, our students better uh, web researchers and, and better um, better synthesizers of, of information. Um, and I'm going to leave this one last slide up here. I'm going to ask Ted to, to jump in and, a, and answer a couple of questions for me. Uh, but just remember that your librarian would love to help you. Uh, visit your teacher librarian or your public librarian, they would be more than happy to help you help your students. Uh, so Ted, there was a couple of questions in here that I that, that I feel like you might be a little bit more equipped to answer than, than I was. Uh, Peggy asked, uh, I'm not sure if you can see that question or not. Uh, when you add your own outside link to a question on Kids Discover, should you specify the source for that question? Uh, Ted, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it all depends. Uh, I think if you are linking out to an outside resource, uh, depending on, on the website or the resource, 
uh, it might be obvious. Uh, some websites are better marked than others. Uh, of course, if you're creating your own question uh, that you've come up with, you're not using a question from a different resource, um, then, uh, uh, you know, I think it's sort of a judgment call. It, it, it sort of depends what there's the ability to do that if you'd like. Uh, and uh, all of the questions that currently exist in uh, Kids Discover Online pertain to the content that's in there. So there's no need to sort of identify additional sources that those are from. I also see there is uh, questions about pricing. I think we answered a couple of them, but for people that we didn't get to, uh, so Kids Discover Online, you can sign up for free. Uh, it's a sort of freemium model where you can get access to a percentage of the library. You'll be able to use Discover Mode. You'll be able to use uh, traditional search and start uh, exploring the amount of content that we have in our library uh, to use, to get full access to the entire library and to start using it with students, we offer up an individual educator account. That's $144 for the year. It comes with 34 student usernames, which are included in the subscription, and students will have access to Kids Discover Online and be able to use it with our classroom features, all the assessment features. That's sort of every feature that we offer up is included in the paid educator account. Again, that's $144 for the year. It uh, comes out to generally about 4 or $5 per student per year. Um, and then up from there, we also do some custom school and district quotes, depending on the number of educators and students that are going to be using it. So um, you can find out more information about that by just going to kidsdiscover.com, or you can send us an email at questions at kidsdiscover.com. Uh, you know, we're talking with educators and administrators every single day, so uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and I would love to add to that, Ted. Uh, even if you, uh, you know, are just using the, the, the free version of Kids Discover Online, uh, you'll find uh, that there are some great resources that get shared by the Kids Discover team uh, on, a, on an almost daily basis uh, that are really accessible to to anyone even if you don't have the the subscription uh, to the service you'll find that the articles uh, that are shared every every few days or so from the kids discover team uh, can make for great conversation starters in your classroom uh, it, it could also make for uh, you know, a great jumping off point for further investigation into into a topic that you know make a great introduction to a topic uh, and I, I believe I saw one just the other day that, that stuck out to me about uh, about the artist's process. And uh, you know, while they, uh, you, know, you may not have the, the full version of Kids Discover Online, I think it's a, a fantastic conversation starter to use uh, with your students to, to spark some spark some interest in in jumping into one of these these webs and finding more information uh, about that. So. Yeah, Richard, I'm actually really glad that you um, brought that up. We did this uh, very cool series on the artists that uh, create original art for Kids Discover and Kids Discover Online. And uh, sort of aside from all of our, our library of nonfiction resources, traditionally how Kids Discover is used, it's a really cool look into the company and how we create content uh, and sort of keep the mindset for uh, our, our student learners uh, when we go and create that. So that's stuff that's right on our blog. It's really cool to check out. Uh, I think, you know, all the employees at Kids Discovery definitely learned a bit through the process, which was fun for us. So, um, you know, just be, just be sure to go to kidsdiscovery.com, check out the blog. Uh, it's a re really fun piece. Great. Thanks, Ted. Uh, and again, for anyone who has any questions about anything that I shared today, whether that's uh, you know, any, of the, any of those little charts and, and pre-search checklists or anything that, that Ted mentioned today, feel free to send me an email. You can email me, richard at burn.media. Uh, you can also reach out to Ted and the Kids Discover team. And uh, I think they're on their email accounts 24-7 from what I can tell. Uh, <laughs> they, they are certainly on top of uh, all messages coming and going. So 
so thanks for joining us today. Uh, as I said, this was all recorded. You'll be, be receiving a, a link to watch the recording if you like. Uh, share, and feel free to share the recording with any of your friends and colleagues who weren't able to make it today as well. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon and, uh, and a great school year. Thanks, everyone.